good afternoon sir good afternoon good afternoon <laughs> good afternoon manoj ji shubhajit from bangalore how are you good afternoon good afternoon mr chatter ji good afternoon <laughs> very well please please yes yes arkesh mani good afternoon sir good afternoon how are you sir how are you i'm thank you long time <laughs> i was on the last video uh, i don't <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Manoj, and good afternoon, Dr. Amalia. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Rakesh. <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Good I am Balanjani, advocate from Delhi. Good afternoon, Madam. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Manoj. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Vardarajan from yeah. Gurgaon. Good afternoon, Mr. Vardarajan. Good afternoon, Vardarajan. Good afternoon, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to this very, very special webinar. My name is Ritika Jhanji, and on behalf of uh, IND India, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome all of you to this very special IOD India Global Webinar. The topic of this webinar, as you all know, is um, restructuring. Is about reshaping our bold strategy to embrace technology for sustainability in this pandemic era now a topic which is very very timely in these times when we are trying to cope up with a global health crisis looking at it covid-19 because of it the global economy is now in a terrible shock and it is putting it all into a tailspin and over the longer period what we see is that covid-19 is irrevocably changing the way businesses compete your agility your scalability your automation these are going to be the new buzzwords that are really going to count in taking your business ahead in times from now and we at institute of directors india we really believe that the role of board directors now their responsibility as a board of directors in the role has become even more vital and more complex than before at this point of time during this period the board should encourage the management to actually do a a broad strategic reevaluation and try and come up and embrace some really bold processes um for example uh, adopting new technologies as various alternatives uh, the importance of remote working technology we all have seen so we need to go on and embrace a lot of such steps that make us more resilient in our business models and more reliable and definitely more competitive so thank you all for joining us this afternoon we have people from like i said los angeles i heard people from singapore also joining in right now um so today we are going to talk about um the status of economy in post corona virus world and how we all can actually move our organizations um cope with it and build better processes with the help of digitization and technology and uh, we are deeply honored because we have uh, some very 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 distinguished leaders joining us this afternoon who will be sharing their words of wisdom and their insight about how boards can actually step up strategies and um, bring in certain policies certain changes certain um, processes that actually help them adapt to the new normal in the new business world so before we get started with the first keynote address we would like to start with lieutenant general jay saluwalia who is the president of institute of directors india general aluwalia very very warm welcome to you i hand over to you for the welcome address thank you my dear good afternoon ladies and gentlemen on behalf of the institute of directors a special welcome to the honored guest speakers members and invited special guests it is for sparing their valuable time for all of us to be together we are happy that even in this dark phase of covid-19 iod is able to meet every 10 days or so to share knowledge and experience with top corporate leaders on how to navigate through troubled waters for both lives and livelihood today's focus is on board strategy to embrace technology for sustainability certainly virus is not going away anytime soon but we never waste a crisis it's an old saying we survive to thrive 
if that is the way old days will not come back a new normal is emerging the remote work is also not a panacea the major disruptions have been in the new opportunities to create the new normal there is a need to retain positives of remote working or video conferencing and speedily focus on recovering revenues we have to rethink the organization rebuild operations and processes adopt digital solutions just imagine that till one year back technologies on video link was 1% of the job in telemedicine in uk today it is 90% with no difference in quality as per that this is really how various organizations are shifting people alone are the really sole repository of knowledge in any organization and they need to be kept in continuing learning mode during the crisis recovery inclusion and diversity are always at risk and they need empathy they are forced to lay off people shave off fixed costs automate seamless transition to a virtual workplace the economy remains demand constrained needing land labor and legal reforms the leaders navigate post pandemic digital recovery from twin threats of lives and livelihood through crucial skills and contactless engagements we operate agile networking teams controlled by a crisis nerve center the supply chains the global supply chains got badly disrupted during this pandemic the vulnerability made them blind ambiguity requires navigation through fog and the supply chains need to be transparent and flexible to mitigate disruptions and be risk resilient for shortened and localized that is what we are trying to do do things at home creating collaborative long term value chains the technology has been growing of course exponentially that is more technology growth in the last 50 years than in the earlier 500 years the technology is not a neutral platform for geopolitics and we recently saw how chinese company huawei was moved out of various countries for 5g applications the accelerated digital technology tactics have become an inflection point during this crisis the technology has pushed us to automation digitization to survive and require a upskilled workforce the network analytics has also become important to diagnose and analyze relative un predictability fragility and the underlying vulnerability of supply chains and customers for a digital recovery the customer centric e-commerce cloud based solutions to transform the crisis navigation through fog into opportunity sustainability requires creating focus and value over a long term horizon a dynamic state with no absolute values the strategy of course is the unique organizational approach to create value it is a dynamic game plan must convert each crisis into an opportunity we need a structured flexible road map to cope with unprecedented social political and economic upheavals for a compelling vision we need corporate change focus from economic to strategic controls the dynamic strategy is being led with optimism that is seeing glass half full rather than half empty as change agents we need an agile resilient and dynamic strategy to navigate through un uncharted waters we need adaptability to embrace with people circumstances and technology 
on an ongoing basis. India needs to align geopolitically and economically to get mileage from this prolonged uncertainty. IOD is continuing to deliver high quality market related solutions for future ready boards. We are very fortunate to have very honored speakers and we look forward to have a good value from all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Lieutenant General Jaya Sadhwali. And very well said, never waste a crisis. Let's try and transform it into an opportunity. But of course, when we're looking at transforming a crisis into opportunity, we're looking up to technology to help us do that. And who better to talk about that than Cisco, the leading player in this field. We are very, very fortunate that for our introductory uh, keynote speech we have with us, um, the president of Cisco India and SAT, Mr. Samir Garde. Mr. Samir, thank you so much for taking our time for this special webinar. Over to you. Uh, please share with us insights on how we can transform this crisis into an opportunity. Hey, uh, thank you, Ritika. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Alwalia. What a, what a privilege and what an honor for me to uh, talk to this August audience. Uh, and I must say, I'm actually more looking forward to uh, listening to the other speakers. Uh, so I'll go quickly through my uh, quick presentation. Uh, <clears throat> you know, this is, uh, this is technology solutions or a digital world which has been forged in crisis, really. Right? And I was listening to uh, the, the Houston police chief today morning uh, on CNN. And it was very interesting, right, what he talked about. He said, uh, he had the gumption to say to uh, Mr. Trump, uh, you know, if you don't have anything of value to contribute, then shut up. Uh, I, I think in these times, uh, while we need technology to manage the pandemic era, we, what we really need are real leaders. Uh, and I know those who follow me and those who are listening over here are all very strong leaders who will ensure that uh, India can come out of this crisis uh, in, a, in a quick and a better way than it is right now. I think this is clearly a new world, right? Uh, you know, uh, Prince Charles doing namaste uh, is probably something which caught the fancy of a lot of people, right? Um, I think people in India will probably get, when you see the, the visual on the right-hand side, probably finally get a lot more disciplined about standing in a queue because of the scare of social distancing and physical distancing. This is something that we've all been worried about not just in terms of uh, standing in a queue, but also giving you physical space in a queue. Um, so I think there are some new rules. And I read today in the morning that there was a, a lot of hullabaloo about middle seats in airlines uh, having to wear a wraparound and two masks, right? Who would have thought, you know, five years ago or even 60 days ago that we would be having discussions about wearing wraparound gowns in an airline? Um, you know, what I'm going to talk about is really what is changing in this world, right? And how is technology helping in, in changing this world? And I think going back to basic, what really, really helps uh, to get you grounded. And I think there are three big trends that we are seeing in terms of shaping this new world. I think number one is rebuilding trust. Uh, I think every business, every process uh, will have to promise health and safety. So. Uh, that, in my opinion, is probably number one thing. And what we are seeing from a technology point of view at a simplistic level is contactless technology delivery, so more cloud delivery. Um, and I think people who are able to provide SaaS solutions, which are basically contactless technology, uh, are the ones who are seeing tremendous uh, uptake of their volumes, right? Uh, personally, I feel even products outside of technology like air conditioners, whether you have uh, you know, your actual taxis. Uber is advertising sanitized Ubers, right? Um, uh, aircon companies are advertising germ-free aircons. So I think there is an element of health and safety which is becoming very, very critical. And from an independent director's point of view, I think there will be new regulation that we will see to build trust with employees, employers, and customers. So I think compliance and guidelines that will come up as a result of this crisis is something that 
will go a long way in building trust. I think clearly we are seeing the emergence of disruptive business models, right? And I don't want to talk too much about it, but it is very clear that if it is online, it is going to sell. Uh, I think that is the, probably the new normal. Uh, if you see grocery shopping, et cetera, has gone through the roof. Uh, Big Basket, if I'm told, is doing three lakh deliveries a day now, which is 2x of what they were doing pre-COVID. Uh, interestingly, and I was looking up thing, Safola, which is a, a brick and mortar brand, Safola has now started doing uh, an online store on uh, Swiggy and Zomato. Uh, and they're basically selling oats and oils and any of those foods, which are health foods, on an online platform, which is dedicated to Safola. Now, these are business models which we would have never thought of earlier. And I think the last thing that we will see is clearly the emergence of automation. Uh, the rise of automation was already there, but now there is what I call a massive disruption happening in automation. Uh, I think three or four technologies which we believe which will become front and center uh, for most companies, irrespective of whether you're a technology company, whether you're a brick and mortar company, or even if you're an SMB, is probably cloud, number one. Number two is AI and ML, and number three is robotics. Um, you know, I was talking to uh, a, a little while ago, maybe around six or seven months ago, I was talking to somebody very senior at the airports authority of India. Um, and there is a plan and some of you may actually know this. There is a plan to auction airspace for drones. Uh, so for the likes of Flipkart and Amazon, etc., to do delivery, there is likely to be a 25 square kilometer airspace, which will be auctioned for these players to actually bid for. Now, these are things which will get accelerated in these times. I think automation to drive down contact is probably the next big thing from a technology uh, point of view for any company. Uh, what does this really mean? I think personally, I feel the four E's mean the most right now, right? Whether uh, you're any kind of company, even if you're an SMB, I think these four E's will, will make all the difference, which is employees and consumers, uh, employers and businesses, of course, the economy and the country and environment and sustainability. And I think sustainability is something I was very pleasantly seen uh, surprised to see that word being used during the course of this uh, discussion on technology during the pandemic era. I'll go very quickly through each one of them. <clears throat> and I'm, I won't go through all the examples, but I think it's important to understand that home is the new base camp for work, shopping, learning, entertainment and socializing. Uh, you know, I think this is something that we will see uh, becoming uh, a new normal in the sense that I don't think you will see 100% of employees in any organization coming back to work uh, or returning to office. That probably is a new, uh, new age that we are emerging into. Uh, TCS, for example, has already declared that 75% of the workforce will work from home in five years from now. Now, this means a lot of good things for a lot of companies, but it means bad things for a few other companies like real estate, et cetera. I think independent but digitally dependent consumers uh, and employees is probably the new normal, right? And I, I say this again because uh, one cloud is not going to be enough. So only AWS or only Microsoft or only Google will not be enough. One collaboration platform, you know, I'm, I'm a WebEx company guy, right? Cisco. I'm currently on Zoom over here. Somebody asked me, Samir, don't you have a problem with that? And I said, listen, today, I think it is the day and age of multi-platform uh, usage. Most people will be comfortable with the Teams, with the WebEx, with a uh, Zoom. Of course, if you want more security, and sorry for this plug, but if you want more security, you should use WebEx. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but I think there will be more innovation. There will be uh, clearly a change in the disposable income of households. Already surveys are being done, which show that on an average, there is an increase of four to 5% in disposable income and savings of US, and US households. Now, 4% is not a small amount if you think about it, right? And in a market like India, where cost of travel is much larger or much higher than the US, where uh, rate of petrol is much higher or diesel is much higher, this saving is going to be actually much more. My personal estimate is this is going to be anywhere between a six to 7% increase in disposable income or savings for that matter, which we will see during the course of the next 60 to 100 days. 
Uh, I think the way we look at employees and consumers now will be very different. Uh, I think coming to uh, what will happen from an employer's and a business's point of view, uh, reduced operational costs. Now, just to give you an example, over the last five years, uh, Cisco has closed down around 239 buildings. 80% uh, of our workforce, even before this pandemic, was already capable of working from home. Uh, so between the last five years, we've closed down 239 or nearly 240 buildings across the world. In India, in the last 60 days, I have already closed down one building in Bangalore. So I think these are things that we are doing, which are making us take decisions, uh, which would have normally taken six months to maybe sometimes two years to do. Uh, I think they've just got very significantly uh, hastened in this process. Uh, in US, close to $10,000 per employee per year will be saved if they work from home. Now think of how a CFO is going to think when he sees that he can save $10,000 per employee per year if that person can work from home. Uh, and we are already doing that exercise to figure out what is the kind of people who can permanently work from home, who can be mobile, and who can be in the traditional working from office kind of a situation, right? I think these are things where we are seeing a tremendous amount of change uh, in the way employers and businesses will look at. Uh, a lot of time is being spent on reskilling and upskill, upskilling of just not just individual contributors, but leaders, managers, and, and this whole stay at home economy has made you a lot more productive. Right. I personally can say I'm probably working anywhere between 15 to 30 percent more than I was pre-COVID. Uh, the only difference between how I'm working today and now and, and then was the difference of travel. And, you know, for the first 20 days, I actually felt good about it. Of course, I'm missing it now. But frankly, if you think about it, I'm actually being able to deliver whatever you, I was able to deliver pre-COVID even today. I think this, in my opinion, will change the way companies and countries will think about it. Uh, we are already hearing about local for vocal. We are already hearing about a lot of noise around protectionism. Uh, there will be a boost for local sourcing and production that will happen uh, going forward as a result of all this. I think from an economy from point of view, personally, I feel there has been a lot of focus and we can argue whether this was uh, a good package, bad package. Uh, but personally, I think the ones which will get most impacted are SMBs. And maybe it is the time of day where SMBs start looking at digital very aggressively. Those SMBs who look at adoption of digital are probably going to have a much higher chance of survival in the future, in this new world, than those who don't. Uh, I think the gig economy is a reality. Um, work from anywhere. It's not about working from home. It's work from anywhere. Now, imagine if you can hire an expert for a day versus having to hire an expert forever on a certain problem that you want to solve. I think those kind of decisions will see more and more happening in terms of a gig economy. Um, we are already seeing, uh, you know, whether you want to look at having a local remote worker versus a global remote worker. Does it really matter where that person resides anymore? Uh, so that could be someone who's doing marketing work outside of your own country, but is delivering the same results. So do you really need to have those people inside the country that you are operating? So I think a lot of changes that we will see in these respects, of course, from an environment and sustainability point of view, uh, we are already predicting that by the end of 2020, in 2020 alone, CO2 emissions will be 8% lower. And they will be actually lower than where we were to in 2006. So think about it. We've actually jumped 14 years of CO2 emissions in the space of 65 to 70 days. Now, obviously, that is teaching us something, right? Hopefully for the longer term. Um, I think we will see uh, clearly a very important part of how uh, healthcare, and I think uh, Mr. Alwalia, General Alwalia talked about this, tremendous growth in the number of telemedicine sessions that are happening. India is always going to be a shortage economy, right? We will have a shortage of teachers. We will have a shortage of doctors. We will have shortage of beds. We will have shortage of nurses and all of those. And I think technology can help 
uh, kind of cross that chasm of shortage uh, by using new and more innovative areas. I think we will see new city designs. Now, I, I may not be very popular with the real estate folks here when I say this, but I think if offices are given up, if commercial real estate becomes uh, a smaller footprint in cities, you will probably see a city design which will be very different. Uh, given that we want trust, more focus on health and safety, I think there will be a more focus around smart, sustainable living and, and, and a city design which is very different. In fact, homes will need to be redesigned. Newer homes will need to think about how people work from home. Currently, our houses in India are not designed for working from home. I think those are things that we will see as a change. Um, finally, I think we should be uh, looking at how can technology help us, of course, right? Uh, so we will see tremendous change in the way uh, low touch solutions become uh, the way forward, right? Anything that you can do with your business, which makes it lower touch, less contact, I think will be the, the future. Uh, 5G and broadband solutions. And believe me, I think India has 600 million people who have access to the internet, but only around 100 million are broadband users. Uh, the rest of them are actually mobile internet users, right? So tomorrow, I think this is going to be very important to ensure that we have good broadband connections in most locations or when we 5G gets launched. And I think that needs to get significantly hastened as we go along. Uh, efficient operations, I think virtual meetings, uh, digital operations, industry 4.0, I think you'll see a lot more of that happening uh, going forward where people have realized that, you know, I can achieve the same results with a virtual meeting uh, versus earlier. Uh, there will be a tremendous amount of focus on technology solutions, which are garnered towards employee experience and customer experience uh, and business model changes and new revenue streams. So I think what we will see is a tremendous change in the way various industries will will reinvent themselves during the course. And finally, I want to just put one more E, which is in this fight of the world versus the virus, right? Uh, there is a bonus E, and that is about empathy and leadership. I think there are some leaders around the world, and when I talk about leaders around the world, I really mean premiers of countries where they have shown tremendous empathy and tremendous leadership. I mean, if you look at New Zealand, if you look at Austria, if you look at uh, the Scandinavian countries. I think they've shown tremendous empathy and tremendous leadership. You know, I was reading somewhere, one of the prime ministers of a country in Europe actually thought about talking to students first before talking to parents. Now, that is something which is about emotionally connecting with people. And that's a leadership that I think this world requires at this stage. Um, I'll keep quiet now. I was told it was 10, 12 minutes, so I'll, I'll let uh, things move on from here. Um, General Alwalia, thanks a lot for your uh, opportunity to give me to talk over here. But um, I think this was uh, a short view into what we think the future will hold for from a technology point of view. Thank you so much, Mr. Samir Gade, for that erudite address. And really, you give a very cohesive uh, picture of the impact touching upon the various sectors um, and mostly positive. So again, um, another way for us to see um, an opportunity in this crisis. And before we move on to our ve next very, very distinguished um, speaker, um, I'm very thankful to all of you, more than 560 of you, I'm told right now, from uh, as far as UK, UAE, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, US, New Zealand, Australia, Costa Rica, and Africa. We have people from all these countries who are joining us for this very, very special webinar. Thank you all. Um, uh, please keep up while we invite the next uh, speaker for the keynote address. And uh, this speaker really needs no introduction. Uh, he's a man who's done many hats and excelled at all of them. I'm talking about Mr. TV Mohandas Pai, who's the chairman of RN Capital. Not just that, he's the chairman of Manipal Global Education, co-founder of Akshay Patra, member of the Board of Governors at NIIFL, and former CEO and board member at Infosys. Thank you so much, Mr. TV Mohandas Pai, for joining us, for sparing time for this webinar. Really looking forward, all of us, to hear from you now. Do we have him here with us? I hope his voice is not 
Do we have Mr. Pai with us? Yeah, yeah, I got it now because you are muting me. Can you see me now? <laughs> yes, yes, we, we can, can see we you can now. See, sir. <laughs> okay. We okay, can folks, see you now. Okay, folks, thank you very much for inviting me. It's good to be here to talk about what boards should do. I think uh, first let me talk about some of the changes that I see. Uh, I believe the world has changed irreversibly for the primary reason that the whole world has been locked in. The virus has impacted the larger part of the world than ever before in the last 100 years that we, uh, we have read history. And we are seeing this change come about and every country in the world is impacted. So it is very global. Second big issue is the global supply chain is getting impacted because China made up 24% of the global manufacturing. And today everybody is asking the same question, how can we de-risk our country and not depend on one single country? So the global supply chain, which has built up after the war, is going to change now with many things spreading all over the country. The oil industry has been deeply impacted and geopolitics are going to change because oil was a $4 trillion economy, which has become a $2 trillion economy. And we don't know whether the oil demand will come back to the same figure that we saw because of many, many changes that we have heard about and will come in future. The service industries have been deeply impacted and that impact is going to continue for some time. Uh, for example, travel, tourism, uh, hospitality, retail, everything else is impacted because people are not going out. And once we come back to normal, we don't know how many will be doing business and doing things that they normally do like earlier. And service is a very large part of the GDP for every country in the United States, 85%. Uh, there is large scale unemployment on the world. US has got 40 million people unemployed who are asking for unemployment relief. In the UK, 1 million people are being paid by the government every month. In Europe, about 8 billion people are unemployed. China has also seen large scale unemployment too. So this unemployment because of the shutdown will continue for some time and global GDP will be hurt. As far as global GDP is concerned, uh, this year the IMF says that uh, GDP may be down two or 3% on $82 trillion. And I do believe that it could be eight to 10% down because this estimate was made in the first quarter in the first quarter, we've seen the US GDP come down 4%, Japan by about 3.5%, UK by about 2%, and we have seen Europe by about maybe 4%, and China has come down by 6%. India has been up 3.1%. We've got to see the final figures. So this quarter, April, May, June, is going to be a horror because April, May, most countries have been shut, and we may see a very deep decline. So the global GDP may come down by 8 to 10% from 82 trillion, may take up to two and a half, three years to come back to 82 trillion that is there. There have been a massive amount of uh, uh, money being put in the market by the central banks. Interest rates, US has come down to 0.25%. In the UK is 0.25 plus negative. Japan is already negative. Before this, out of $36 trillion of government bonds, $18 trillion were negative. And uh, all the central banks have pumped in more than six to $7 trillion of liquidity into the market. Uh, there have been large scale stimulus, six and a half billion, trillion dollars of stimulus all over. The United States at two and a half trillion. And I believe the stimulus will have to increase by the end of the year to something like 10 trillion. So we are not seeing anything like this ever. And this is really, really big. And this also impacted people. People's habits have changed. People have been logged in for 45, 60 days. Like the earlier speaker said, uh, everything has become technology led. And when people's habits change, the way they live, the way they work will change. And today, the positive impact on the environment is being seen in most countries on the world. We are being breathing fresh air. The waters have become clean. And uh, possibly, people have become more healthy. I was speaking to Dr. Balal in uh, Bangalore. He's telling me the death rate in India has come down. Well, we have been shut. We normally lose 160,000 people for accidents. So nobody is traveling except for some of the poor migrants. And uh, Mumbai used to have 10 to 12 people die in the railway, railway uh, travel. I think that's not there anymore. But nevertheless, because of uh, uh, personal hygiene, because of uh, better habits, I think the death rate has come down. And that is a good thing, despite the COVID being there. So I think that's important. So all this means the world is going to change irrevocably. And what should boards do uh, in, when, they, when they face the change? Well, first, the board should look at the business model and the business strategy. Business strategy decided by the boards globally. So they must see what has been the strategy so far and have they been successful is the business model impacted? And I think the business model of all companies is impacted because what would have happened the next two to five years in terms of digitization automation is happening right now. 
and consumer behavior has changed. So every facet of their business for a company has to be seen by the board and they have to check up the business model to make sure the business model is still relevant and make changes in the business model. Second, they have to use technology and technology has become all pervasive, automation, use of tech tools, etc. And I think the boards have to be very careful that uh, they realign the business based upon consumer habits. And that means they have to use tech. And if you're not able to transition to tech, then you're in deep trouble. Many of them have been transiting to tech for a period of time. Now it has to be done in a great hurry. Uh, boards also have to look at compliance. The whole system of compliance won't work. The many good products come about, like Shankar Jagannathan, Simplify is here, Darwin Box for HR, etc. All these new companies have come, which are very light, using cloud, etc. So people will start using this kind of technology and compliance is something the board has to make sure that it works because compliance was based upon physical papers being all over the place and now everything has become electronic. And then using tech, they have to devise a technology strategy uh, for all companies. And the tech strategy means that you have to talk to your vendors, use your uh, outsourcing partners, etc. Because no company will have tech resources or uh, will be able to hire people to do everything for themselves. Today, fortunately, there's a lot of new cloud-based light technology, which is very, very cost-effective and not heavy like the earlier generation. So I think the tech strategy has to be very clear. And based on the tech strategy, they have to relook at the people strategy. Like the earlier speaker said, people will work from home. Do you really need so many people? Do you, what kind of people do you need? Who can work from home, et cetera? And once you look at the people strategy, then you can fit in people and the gig economy is going to expand because so many of us were hiding people, getting specialists, and we've never been able to use them fully. Now I think that has to change. And then lastly, I think the financial flexibility has to be seen. I saw a survey that said that uh, out of 100 MSMEs, 25% uh, have enough cash for one month, maybe 25% of cash for three months, and the balance maybe for six months. So today, because of the lockdown, uh, everybody has been hurt. Everybody's revenue has come down. In the month of April, not a single passenger car was sold in India. And when a single passenger car is not sold, you can imagine what will happen. Even in the month of May, it is down. Government revenues from GST is down. Government borrowings are shot up to the roof. And therefore, there is a problem about, uh, about the finances of most corporations. And many of the big companies have drawn undrawn limits from the banks. And the banks too are depending upon the central banks to give them the kind of liquidity which has been pumped in. So every board has to evaluate its financial strategy to see, will they have enough cash to survive if they don't get revenues for one full year? At Infosys from 94, we had a policy that we'll have enough cash in the balance sheet uh, to, to meet all our expenses without running a single penny of revenue for a year. And after 25 years, it's actually come true. And people thought that we're crazy, we had too much of liquidity, et cetera. But I think financial flexibility is required because we just can't borrow money. Financial flexibility can be in the form of cash on the balance sheet, liquid assets, or in the form of credit lines. So all companies have to look and see how they can do all that. The next is they must improve the governance of the boards. The boards must have a better risk management strategy because we don't know what kind of risk are going to come. They must have the capacity to evaluate risk, create proper frameworks. They must have the ability to relook at the strategy and monitor the strategy and create flexibility. They must create a business model which is flexible without too high fixed costs. Once you have high fixed costs, cost, you're doomed because high fixed cost means lower margins. You must see how to convert your fixed cost into variable cost so that your break even comes in at much lower levels. And also in times of crisis, you can't lay off people because of the humanitarian issue. So you've got to be very careful the number of people that you add on, the kind of people that you add on, and how do you create a network for partners, how you become part of an ecosystem where there are many other people who can help you out and use the jig economy to make sure that you have flexibility for growth. And you also have to look at the competitive environment. China has been deeply hurt as a factory of the world. The Chinese are going to dump uh, the goods in all countries. And in services too, the market is going to become extremely global. global. Finance is going to be available on the global scale. And everything that we held dear has changed. And maybe it is time for people who have been at the top for a long period of time to see whether they can get in fresh blood to re re rejuvenate the boards. Uh, because the board has got people with a lot of experience who've been there for a long time. It's quite possible they're out to date with what uh, the world is today. They're out of date with technology. They're not in touch. So you have to get technology experts in the composition of the boards and make sure that it works. 
and uh, also you have to look at sustainability today the world has seen a reduction in carbon discharge into the environment and uh, we are going to see a much more demand from civil society that we change the business model we change the way society lives and consumes energy to make sure that uh, climate change can be managed for the first time we had a pleasant surprise where we actually saw a uh, climate change getting reversed for some time and i think uh, this is uh, important so we're going to see much more legislation as far as sustainability is concerned so esg is going to become very important and if you're a listed company you don't follow esg you will not get the big pension funds the big investors hold your stock and the data is there to say that companies who have been following esg will be the companies who will do very well in future so i would like to end here by just saying the world has changed the old way of supply chain has changed uh, human habits and consumer habits have changed the world is awash with the liquidity large scale unemployment and uh, which will take some time to come back and uh, global business and global economies have been very deeply hurt governments have taken a huge huge step forward in giving large scale stimuluses and this has an impact on industry the business model of every industry has to be seen by the board and changed we need to have a deep tech strategy because everything rides on tech today and build up the competencies or use partners for that you have to use technology for compliances and all the board functions you have to have a people strategy based upon what you need and how to utilize people when people largely work from home or don't come to a central place and the people start using technology and you got to create a new financial model based upon flexibility based upon liquidity and based upon availability of credit lines to take care of unforeseen unforeseen circumstances you have to improve risk management capacity etc you have to rejuvenate the board and get in fresher blood younger blood who are in tune with reality uh, because change is going to be dramatic in the next two or three years so a tough time for boards and i think uh, it'll be very exciting to see what happens in the future thank you very much thank you so much mr mohan das pai for digging into your vast experience and sharing and urging the need of um, of the boards to realign their organizations to this new situation thank you so much for taking our time for being thank part you. of this webinar thank you and before i move on to the next uh, very inspiring keynote speaker we blind up uh, i would like to share with all of you who are with us in this webinar uh, that in numbers across 600 we have about uh, uh, representation from more than 10 countries right now so there are 600 of you on this platform thank you so much for showing so much enthusiasm for this up next now let me move on to um, the next keynote address and to deliver that i would like to invite dr santuru b mishra who is um, the ceo of birla carbon and director of chemicals and director of group hr aditya birla group there we have him with us thank you so much sir for joining us this afternoon we would really like to hear from you your perspective on this current situation thank you ritika and good afternoon friends uh, special good afternoon to my good friends many of whom are on the call who have separately sent me whatsapp thank you all for being there i think i'll take off from where mohandas left off saying that the world has changed is so true the world has changed but we are all trying to collectively figure out has it changed for the better or has it changed for the worse i think the jury is still out i think sustainability amongst many other things depends very vitally on a corporation's ability to inspire trust and confidence in its stakeholders about itself and i think trust and confidence which are so vital to sustainability are often most stressed or most tested under stressful circumstances and i don't think it requires say great mind to figure out that obviously this pandemic that we are experiencing is creating one of the greatest uh, stressful times of our lifetimes i think many of us were born in post uh, second world war situation perhaps on this audience uh, would have not seen anything as significant uh, drastic um, kind of overarching uh, threatful that, that we are seeing through this covid-19 now of course most companies try to create uh, business continuity plans uh, imagining different kinds of scenario to figure out that how they remain sustainable in the face of different kinds of threats but those of us who have worked on boards or at the senior management level we always know that often business continuity plans are focused on many known sources of threats particularly to the infrastructure uh, of of the vital critical infrastructure and input material uh, sometimes supply chain etc cetera, etc cetera. 
But this is the first time, perhaps, a very unknown, unknowable, unanticipated uh, source of uh, threat that is trying to create complete disruption all over the world simultaneously uh, in a very far-reaching way uh, that, that anyone has experienced. I think in the past crisis that we have noticed, uh, uh, we have seen that perhaps one part of the world, one industry, uh, or a certain segment of society or geography have been threatened. And never before uh, we have seen a crisis that is so global, so deep, uh, so far reaching, touching all of us at the same time. And, and there's nobody to rely on to kind of deal with that because, because everybody is equally impacted. So our ability uh, to support each other has been limited, even though we have read about uh, certain countries uh, supporting certain other countries with masks or PPEs, and those have been subject to political controversy, as is usually the case in the world. But one of the important things to remember, perhaps, is that technology, which is ubiquitous and is perhaps been all pervasive, uh, lately, uh, subtly absorption of technology, adoption of technology cannot be a sudden phenomenon and cannot be done overnight. It takes a long time. It requires planning. It requires investment. It requires uh, thoughtful building into strategy. And it has to be thought through in peace times. It is very unfortunate if some of the boards so far have not deeply thought about it and have not worked on it. Uh, obviously, today, all boards should be clamoring and uh, running around to figure out what could their technology strategy be, investment be, adoption of technology be, but that would be very, very sad. As uh, General Alu Alia mentioned, and he referred passingly, and Samir did too about telemedicine, I recall about 10 or 12 years ago, in Aditya Birla Group, I had adopted telemedicine for our remote manufacturing units, which are in back of beyond areas of India, to make sure that I connected them with leading hospitals and urban centers so that my colleagues working in those remote areas never feel uh, inadequately supported in terms of health care. And I'm glad to see that something that I faced a lot of resistance at that point in time. And I must say even including from our doctors in our hospitals in remote areas who did not want to kind of accept telemedicine as an alternative. And my heart gladdens today when I see that we did the right thing 10, 12 years ago and today the world is moving to telemedicine. There's been a lot of articles, discussion around absorption of technology and why uh, and, and when does it happen. Obviously, uh, we all know that absorption of technology is determined by many factors. Uh, the state of the uh, industry or sector, for example, if you see today that a lot of garment companies, uh, aviation companies, uh, hospitality companies are deeply impacted now, when you are in such a state where the cash flow is almost uh, zero, as Mohandas talked about, no automobile sales, I lead a business that is deeply connected with the transport and automobile sector, so I do understand uh, the presses. When a business is dumping uh, you know, in, in the grounds, I don't think boards suddenly can wake up to decide making large investments in technology. So the state of industry or sector determines how much of technology is adopted, absorbed, etc. Second is the life stage of the company. I think in a high growth industry, uh, particularly let's say e-commerce or many of the technology companies, when those are happening, I think technology uh, absorption, new technology identification, uh, all of that kind of take a life of their own. Similarly, demographic of employees, the demography itself determines uh, how well technology is absorbed in a company. Uh, for example, those companies that are much younger people, they often demand technology. Um, I had one young lady who barely had joined about three weeks in the Aditya Birla group and said to me, why hasn't all the travel reimbursement process really automated? And obviously, you know, that question triggered to a chain of reaction and we today are much more automated on those basic processes than we were. Of course, similarly, the leadership and the vision of leadership and the vision of the board, both are very critical in terms of adoption of technology. Those leadership... Uh, uh, management teams or boards that are visionary often have made the right investments at the right time rather than wait for uh, a crisis of this kind. Now, one of the important questions to ask is, many of the boards are kind of got very smart people, uh, intelligent people who are preeminent in their fields, but why is it that this, this vision about adoption of technology that the world is moving in that direction, why is it that it is not so kind of obvious to many of the boards and what happens? 
first of all, we need to look at the several boards under law also kind of have extended uh, the age bracket of board members significantly. And you find that obviously those of us who are much older in our age bracket are not the real digital natives, we are immigrants. So our relative appreciation of what technology is relatively low. And in fact, it's an important issue is to ask what is technology? Those of us who survived through Y2K believe technology is something. Then perhaps those who grew up in personal computing thought maybe a laptop or a desktop was technology. But technology today has gone into everything. Uh, the medicine itself, uh, uh, the, the pathology, for example, uh, education, uh, for example, even product technology, uh, the bacteria-free fabric, for example, uh, my company Madura Garments that has many branded apparel is experimenting, can they have a, a bacteria viral resistant fabric so that you don't have to come out and every time you don't have to immediately wash because you are afraid of coronavirus. Second part is, is exposure. Many of the boards have very limited uh, exposure to where the world of technology is going, what are the new developments. Sometimes occasionally boards take a kind of annual holiday to the Silicon Valley, hoping that they will get overnight transformed and exposed into technology. But there is need for consistent investment into that exposure of the board is necessary. And I'm very glad to see that Samir Garde is with us here. I remember some eight, nine, 10 years ago when John Chamber was the CEO and chairman of Cisco and I, you know, the, the IT function is to report into me. I'd invited John Chamber that time to come and address the internal board of the Aditya Bella group to talk about where technology was going and what is not happening. Similarly, I don't think many of the boards have been you know, very well qualified finance professionals, maybe R&D professionals, but real, really people who have hardcore interest in new generation technologies. I think there is a dearth of that with, with Mondas Pai also referred to. The board demography also is a problem that, as I talked about uh, age factor, and of course, myopia is a problem that is there in many boards. So what is, what is the solution to all of this? I think we are very good at in India identifying problems, but not too good at solving those. I think first thing is that there needs to be a key awareness, understanding, appreciation, call, call it uh, uh, technology fluency, like language fluency that must exist in the board members. And the boards must consciously make an effort to improve the technology fluency quotient of the board members through exposure, presentations, exposure to ecosystems, and many other ways that are available. The board's own working must also reflect their technology orientation. I have been in boards where even today, piles of papers come, the board portals are either not available, or even when board portals are available, there are several directors who are uncomfortable, still ask for the agenda copy and backup presentation and hard copies to read. Now, a technologically oriented board must uh, lead the way by example, showing that whether it is compliance, secretarial work, board portal, all of this are synchronously working to make the board's own environment itself very, very high technology. And also as they discuss about strategy, I think uh, strategy, sustainability, and customer are three key elements of focus that every board must have. I think they need to learn to ask technology-related questions pertaining to all of these elements and how they tie those together. Uh, I think uh, the, the nature of discussion in the board and obviously the overall data culture in the company are very, very critical and vital uh, for, for absorption of technology. I think two things we need to remember finally, that if a board all the time keeps looking at investment into technology as a cost, I think this transformation will not happen. If the board does not learn to ask technology related questions, questions around digital uh, rate of adoption, competitive benchmarking around digital and technology adoption of this company vis-a-vis -vis the comp competition. I think unless the board becomes forward looking, uh, comparative in its approach and looking at technology as a critical driver and enabler and making the right investments rather than treating it as a cost. And the last point I want to make also is I do not know how much of the board interacts with technology leaders within the company, be it the R&D head, be the CIO, be the data analytics head, be the digital head, call it whatever name you have, but you always have in your company a bunch of very senior uh, people representing, uh, so to speak, the technology diaspora or the technology uh, community. And I think there must be structured arrangement in the board's agenda 
informal interaction, etc., for the board to uh, get an insight uh, from these people and from the bottom of the organization as to where technology could be relevant in customer service, technical service, uh, better experience delivery. Because if all of that do not come together, then there could be a very piecemeal approach to technology. Uh, either there would be overinvestment in one area, there could be scarcity and starvation in another area. So I think there must be a conscious effort to create a very holistic technology map that supports uh, the sustainability agenda, the customer agenda, and of course, the, the core strategy of the business. So I think the journey has begun. Uh, many boards are more sensitive today than they were subtly 10 years ago. But I think uh, for a country like India, for a whole host of reasons that uh, Mohandas and Samir talked about in terms of macroeconomic changes, consumer behavior changes, uh, the, the, the awareness of citizens and, and our own uh, kind of comfort level of ordinary customers and citizens with, with uh, dealing uh, through technology and accessing government offerings and services through technology. Uh, we need to understand that this is becoming a central part of uh, business life, corporate life, and lives of human beings and citizens. And therefore, boards need to find ways and means of engaging themselves uh, better, uh, faster, and sharper with the technology agenda. Uh, so thank you very much for having me here. Uh, if there are any question answer time, we will go into that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mishra. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and coming up with something uh, so insightful like technology influency. I think that will make sense to a lot of directors. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you to him and thank you to all the other leaders who joined us this afternoon and spoke about um, various aspects of uh, this crisis and somewhere where we can actually turn it around and what all do we need to do to do that as board of directors. And I'm sure all of you have a lot of questions. So um, it is time for me to move towards the Q&A session. And to take the Q&A session, I would like to invite Mr. Srikant Sharda, who's the MD of Accenture, Technologies. Accenture, we all know, is um, a leader in uh, transformative technology, and uh, he's with us now to take forward the Q&A session. Thank you, uh, Ritika. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, General Ahluwalia. Uh, thanks, uh, Samir Kar Karde, Mr. Mohan Daspai, and uh, Dr. Mishra for your insight. Uh, Mr. Garde, I, I learned something new about your 4E plus 1E extra model, uh, which is really good. Uh, Mr. Mohandas Pai, thank you for your view on the global impact uh, on the board and six areas that board need to look at about business model relook, tech strategy, realignment to the consumer needs, compliance, financial uh, flexibility, and more importantly, the governance that you have been practicing for many, many years uh, during the Infosys days. And Ms. Dr. Mishra, I really like that you have been the leader in the telemedicine 10, 12 years back. Now everyone is going for that one, but I think you were the early adopter of that. And a good view on the, what is the good compo uh, composition of the board, right? So I think a very wide topic. And if you have any questions, uh, please ask the questions on the chat window. Uh, my two kind of sense on this uh, overall pandemic is that uh, this pandemic is driving us to have a physical distancing while take, and I will not call it social distancing because in India we can't call it a social distancing, but physical distancing and the technology is helping the meet of the people, psychological need to meet and inter interconnect uh, connect with them to drive discussion, to drive some new innovations and collaboration work. And what has happened in last 60, 90 days is that few billion people has really changed their behaviors and start adopting technology. I not imagine, or none of us imagine that the schools will be using Teams or Zoom calls to do the online sessions. Uh, and there has been a massive change. It feels like two, three years of transformation has happened in two, three months. And since it has happened so fast, I'm sure the audience has a lot of questions to ask this extinct panel. Uh, so, uh, if you have any questions, as I mentioned, please put it on the chat window. However, since I am running this uh, Q&A session, I have maybe take the liberty to ask the first question and that to uh, Mr. Garde. Uh, you talked about technology and uh, people, not 100% people coming back to office. Uh, what is in your view uh, that uh, will have the impact on overall people and uh, the way we have been working 
uh, and the overall culture of the company? So I think a few things. So, uh, Mr. Sarda, thanks a lot for this opportunity again, and thanks for the question. So I think a, a few things will happen, right? One, uh, I think people are already talking about uh, getting a little bored sitting at home, right? So I think that's probably the first thing that I'm hearing uh, after the first 20 days of euphoria of saying I'm working from home. I think in the last 20 days, one is hearing a lot more about people getting a little you know, cloistered in their head, uh, so to say. So I think uh, a lot of companies will need to start talking about uh, mental well-being besides just physical well-being. I think a lot of effort has been made around that. The second piece that comes from a technology dimension, I think, is security. And a lot of, uh, when I say security, I mean cybersecurity. You know, I was looking at one of our customers uh, has ac who's given access to the internet to, uh, uh, to their employees, right? In the space of 20 days, uh, around 1,000, 2,000 employees accessed 3 billion websites. 3 billion websites, right? Uh, so these are 3 billion URLs, unique URLs, which were accessed by around 2,000 employees in a 20-day period. Typical ratio of malicious URLs on malicious websites are to the tune of around three to five percent, right? So when you do the math there, I think that becomes probably one of the biggest thing that boards should be looking at. Uh, you know, cybersecurity has already been elevated to the level of the board now, but I think it's probably got a lot more accentuated <clears throat> because you know people have access to applications and uh, their work from home and have the option of being outside the company network. Uh, so I think that probably is the second big thing that uh, companies need to look at. And I think the third is, and I'll talk to, touched upon it a little bit, <clears throat> is the style of leadership, right? Um, I think in today's time, uh, till we come out of this, which could be anywhere between 90 to 360 days, um, in my opinion, empathy is something very difficult to teach, but it needs to become a part of the new way of leadership. Um, and it needs to be a lot more accentuated uh, than it has been in the past, right? Where I think the American style of leadership, which is in your face, uh, was something that was uh, accepted as the way of leadership. Personally, I feel more collaborative, more empathetic leadership is the order of the day. I think trainings around that is probably, those are the three things I would probably call out. Thank you, Mr. The, the next, we have a lot of questions coming on the chat window now. So next question is to for Mr. Mohandas Pai. Uh, how much does compliance play an important role during these tough times? And I'll add my bit in that one. And how you see technology playing the role to deliver the compliance in this tough time? Well, obviously for the board, compliance is very important uh, because you have to obey the law. And there's a board's responsibility to ensure that full compliance is done because the board will be held responsible. Even though the company's act has been amended to remove many criminal provisions, the board can still be criminally liable and the board won't even know what is happening. Yep. So the board has to focus on compliance. And today there are many tools, uh, many, many much software. For example, uh, Shankar Jagannathan of Wipro has created a fabulous board compliance toolkit called Simplify. And I think that works fabulously. Uh, remote board meetings, uh, board documentation, complying with labor laws, corporate law, all kind of laws, checklists, everything else. So if you're able to use a piece of software, then you can know what is happening and it can be pervasive. So I think it's very important uh, because obviously uh, if you are in breach of the law tomorrow, you could be hauled up and the things could happen to you. So I think that's very important for technology. And today we are very fortunate that uh, all this is available in the cloud uh, at a very low cost. So I think uh, boards have to focus on that. Yes, what is the second question? How technology can, and that was my addition, uh, Mr. Pai, about how technology can enable that easier yeah. compli uh, compliance. Yeah, compliance has become easy because today is all in a checklist. It is linked to URLs. I mean, linked to URLs about the law, is linked to APIs for uh, filing forms, etc. Things are automated to a great extent. So I think if you have a risk management system where compliance is part of the risk framework, then I think you'll do very well. Thank you, Mr. Pai. 
Third question uh, is, uh, again, it's kind of, I think, coming to sequence to Dr. Mishra, uh, and you spoke about uh, the core compositions and all that. The question is, what will the CXO uh, level uh, reshuffle expected after COVID-19, especially to take care of the technology and the role that plays in the business? So, Dr. Mishra? Well, I don't think that perhaps there's going to be a fundamental change in the CXO level roles and responsibilities, but I think there'll be elements that will get added on to every CXO's role. And those elements would be one, subtly uh, propagating and protecting employees' health, hygiene, mental health, uh, those kind of elements. Uh, second would be also identifying elements of the role uh, or the delivery process where technology adoption can be enhanced uh, to both improve experience and avoid any disruptive impact of physical transactions. And the third part, perhaps uh, every CXO's role is likely to be that how do we uh, influence the mindset of everyone around to adopt technology faster. Uh, and, and that mindset will not only be confined to employees of the corporation, but also the customers and vendors it was very interestingly, we found that during these last two months, wherever we could dispatch material, as you know, when material gets loaded on a truck, there are certain documentation goes, there were customers who wanted all documentations digitally. There were also customers who were not digitally prepared enough, therefore wanted that you should deliver it physically in the paper form as you were doing, uh, you know, in the, in the good old days. So I think there's always uh, this challenge going to be there that how do you adapt uh, uh, both both uh, uh, the, the, the comfort level of some customers and vendors with the digital okay. world and otherwise. But I think the CXO's role in helping uh, the entire ecosystem to adopt technology faster and more will be one of the uh, accentuated parts of their role. I don't think there'll be any new role. Some companies may create a crisis manager role or whatever role, a couple of them. Sometimes we are a little fancy in creating uh, kind of temporary roles to respond to a situation, even though they may, some companies may create, they may be more project-based. But I don't think fundamentally uh, some of those roles will vanish. Some of the roles, the way they are delivered and from where they are delivered, those could be questions, of course. Whether they need to be delivered from the headquarters or in office space or could be remotely delivered through technology, those would be elements that, that would kind of change. Sure. Ritika, uh, I know we are, uh, we have kind of stop at 3.30, uh, 20 more minutes. Do we have time for one or two more questions? Because I'm getting so many questions on the chat window. I may not be able to cover all of them. Yeah, I think we can take one or two. Keep our answers also brief. Okay, sure. okay. so uh, next question is very important from a technology point of view. And it is, uh, maybe I address it to Samir. Uh, the question is, what kind of transformation do you see in cybersecurity and risk through hardware and software misuse? I, I believe this becomes more important, especially when you are working from home, the, the traditional office security, IT security may not be as strong as uh, they're at home. So any thoughts on that, Samir? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think I, I kind of touched upon it in my first answer, and I'll probably repeat that a little bit. But, you know, it was very interesting as around 75, 80 days ago, one of the large IT, ITS companies came to us that we want to move our folks to work from home. And there were different types of problems that kind of came up, right? At a very basic level, we realized that even today, a very large proportion of IT, ITS workers, which is around four and a half million workers, uh, still have desktops, right? Uh, second thing that we realized was that they did not have encrypted hard disks. Very simple thing, um, but very, very important thing when you're moving work home. Right. So if you don't have an encrypted hard disk, data is something which is at of value for you and for your clients, uh, which can get uh, out of control and can have an impact on uh, how India is seen as an outsourcing destination. I think the third piece is a lot of uh, movement towards the cloud is creating access to the Internet as the next big right? Uh, because most of your applications are on the cloud nowadays. Uh, so access to the cloud through the internet is probably on the one hand, the most susceptible in terms of security. Uh, and on the other hand has the maximum number of solutions available at this point in time, because that's a growing market. 
So I think from a board point of view, the questions that need to be asked is uh, when we give access to the internet um, and we give access to applications through the cloud, what is the kind of authentication we are uh, asking for? Is this a single factor authentication, dual factor, multi-factor authentication? Because I think it's important you, you verify the device, you verify the user, and you verify the user versus the policy. Uh, so I think those are things which, and the, the, we can talk about this for 45 minutes, it's a very large and vast topic. Uh, but it, it kind of opens up to a lot of uh, risks at one end. Uh, but the good part is that the industry is innovating in a very fast way uh, in this space. Thanks. The last question, maybe we'll talk for Dr. Von Bondas. So I, uh, this question is about technology and the people aspect of it, more from a social social point of view. There, as you mentioned about large number of unemployment in various countries because of this COVID issue, and at other end, we're talking about technology. So how technology can balance the unemployment uh, part of it so that it doesn't seem as a counterproductive, and especially this is more from a socialistic point of view about how do we deal with people and the technology at the same time? Well, we need to understand that India is a supply constrained market, not a demand constrained market. Because we have a lot of growth to come here. We are just a per capita of $2,200 for 1.37 billion people. So we are not like the US, which is saturated with $55,000 per capita, right? So there in the US, if new technology come, it could replace human beings here. Technology will make business enterprises more competitive, make them much more efficient, much more productive, and increase value. That value will lead to higher investment, lower cost of production, and better sales. Because the country like India, which is price sensitive, if you're able to bring down the price of your product a bit, you know, the market expands exponentially. And I think that has been seen in the cell phones, right? How a cell phone, which is costing 20,000, has now become 10,000. Market has gone up 5x, 6x. So I think technology in India will be very different from the use of technology outside. And it's going to create much more jobs because we need uh, much more investment in very many areas. So we're not going to face this problem. There could be some temporary problem, but there is tremendous amount of growth that is there inherent in India. Whereas in the developed economies, which are fully saturated, the growth will be anemic, one, one and a half, two percent. And there the productivity growth because of technology could uh, do away with people in a much more uh, massive way because efficient to put in a robo instead of a human being. In India, in many, many, much part of the world, the robots become much, much more expensive. So I think, you know, this will only make India much more, effective, much more efficient, more productive, and uh, increase investment and create more jobs for the next decade at least. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pai. And just to add, to add was to kind of two, pens, uh, two cents from my side is that this our technology will bring the new roles uh, into the marketplace. So, People who are doing the particular role right now, they will be able to, by doing upskilling and cross-skilling, they will be able to do a different role and that will drive the further growth as Mr. Pai mentioned. So, Ritika, over to you for the next section. I know we are uh, in short of time, but over to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Srikant Sharda, for uh, taking this forward so um, effortlessly. Thank you to all the leaders for sparing time and joining us for this Q&A session. It's been a great learning experience. And now we're going to add some practical knowledge to this experience by bringing forth our next uh, keynote speaker, who's going to share with you the experience of GIIS virtual schools. We have with us Mr. Atul Temurnikar, who is the co-founder and chairman of GIS. Uh, the institution though is based out of Singapore, but I must tell you that they have the campuses in seven countries, and he's going to talk about how they rode over the tide of COVID-19 successfully uh, with the help Hello. of virtual classrooms. Very warm welcome, Mr. Atal. Hi, good afternoon to all of you. And it's a pleasure to see everyone. Uh, thank you for having me at the IOD webinar. I think today we are looking at welcoming innovations by people all happening due to COVID. But if people and customers are changing this rapidly, then boards too ought to change quickly and relook at embracing technology, not just for sustainability, but in some cases for survival as well. Over the last two decades, the Global Schools Foundation has been preparing future-ready and responsible global citizens. Technology has played a huge role in our sustainability and in our growth plans. We have three broad verticals, first being the international schools vertical, and then the culture and sports arm, 
and the last one being the free community schools that we run in India. By 2008, we had embarked on a journey of business excellence, thanks to our patron, Mr. Narada Murthy. And I'm proud to say that today, after 10 years, GSF have set a world record and are now winners of over 150 Education Excellence Awards around the world. Probably uh, it's, it's much higher than the second, uh, second highest, which has won these awards. But by 2014, we started conceptualizing the idea of school of the future, and we started implementing it. For some of you who are not from education, these are terms that may sound very unfamiliar, but essentially they all link back to technology. In 2018, our first smart campus, which originated from the School of the Future, commenced operations in Singapore with a full emphasis on next-gen learning. By 2020, we are here today with the virtual schools, ready to take on the latest challenge. Today, GSF schools have students from 70 countries, 70 nationalities, offering linguistic diversity and cultural exposure, giving our students a truly global experience. This is offered through the 21 campuses we have spread across ASEAN, South Asia, Middle East, and India, and to over 15,000 students. Soon, we went about replicating the idea of smart campus in other parts of the world, from Tokyo to Dubai to Bangalore and many other locations, building some brilliant campuses. A question that often gets asked, what's so special about these students or the school that you get almost three times the number of university offers compared to the number of students? It's not a big secret and I will share some key reasons for this. For these universities, the GSF schools are a place to find the perfect blend of academic results, well-suited skills, and structurally developed holistic persons. Each year, over 150 plus universities, including some Ivy League universities, visit the schools in person or in virtual. And sometimes we get almost three times the number of university offers but almost all students get guaranteed placements and some even get scholarships. Some are lucky to get government scholarships too. In fact, over 45% 45, 45 of our students each year are placed at the Singapore universities alone and in Asia and in Australia. And it gives me immense pleasure to share something which is very recent, as recent as two days. And it's linked to one of our GIS alumni who is linked to the SpaceX program. Yes, the famous Elon Musk's SpaceX launch that launched the two American astronauts to the ISS station and rolled out a historic space program. GI Singapore student of IB class 2014, Ms. Kanika was a proud team member of the SpaceX team and had served there on the Falcon 9 landing legs. She has not only made our GIs proud, but also has made Singapore proud and India proud too, being an Indian. Year upon year, our students give us exemplary results in their board exams. Given the fact that we are not a selective school, which means we don't take only the meritorious students, we take these students and transform them into extraordinary performers. In the IB diploma exams, 39 of our students have ranked as world toppers, scoring 45 out of 45 and near perfect scores of 44. This is not alone. In the International Cambridge exams, or IGCSE, 78 of our students have scored A stars in all subjects. In CBSC, things were not lagging behind. We had one of our students who was CBSC topper in the entire Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Every teacher in our school is empowered with a very powerful in-house developed technological and analytical tool called the 7S. This provides a comprehensive analysis about the student's academic strengths and plan ways to improve and enhance the performance based on this data. These student improvement plans, or we call them SIP, are strategies which are evidence-based, carefully crafted, and meant for improvement programs. Similarly, in the sports, we use data analytical tools 
called SPEDAS as sports performance enhancement data analytic systems. This is part of our efforts to uplift our school sports to the national level. These are very high end systems that are generally used by the likes of NBA in basketball or the FIFA teams in soccer. SPEDAS is of course currently available at our smart campuses in Singapore and India and are being rolled out gradually to other countries as well. Every year, we run the Entrepreneurship Bootcamp, the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Bootcamp, and are joined by senior faculty from the NCR Business School in Singapore. This is to boost the creativity and problem solving capabilities and skills for each child. We were always a technologically advanced school. After what we have seen due to the COVID, it is interesting to see how our early adoption of some of the school of the future concepts are now making an absolute sense. Our introduction of blended learning combines the learning from digital classrooms with learning from virtual classrooms and learning from nature-based classrooms and even open classrooms. I think today's students have multiple options to choose from. And with this unique COVID experience, students are going to see a bigger proportion of blended classrooms or blended learning taking in their lives. The digital classrooms were a major part of our school and School of the Future initiative. They were like the heart or the central nervous system and widely researched, prototyped and benchmarked to be the best among the schools in the world. The GSF digital classrooms had everything from video conferencing. So in fact, we started using Zoom very early. We have been using WebEx as well. And uh, other than that, screen sharing, location sensing for various analytics, touch screen displays, facial recognition for attendance, RFID digital lockers, high speed broadband, Wi Fi, CCTV, etc. Now, one would say that these classrooms, which were Zoom webinar ready, allowing students to join classes from the comfort of the homes and engage in student programs with other GIS campuses as well in a global space. Each classroom has one or two multimedia touchscreens, which make the multimedia lessons much more engaging. Location sensing is used to create data mining for student movements and staff movements within the campus and generate further heat maps for better facility optimization. Digital student lockers, are, which are using RFID, are made available to every student for storage of books and sports equipment. Facial recognition is provided to each and every student, each and every classroom, or on a respective floors for student attendance. CCTV as commonly used is used for safety, but we decided to provide them in each of the classrooms and not just there, but in also all the corridors and staircases. Of course, we had ensured our network infrastructure was matching the highest performance that we wanted of 40 GB. So we chose to work with Cisco for the switches. And back in 2015, I got to, I got to have a chance to have a side chat with Mr. John Chambers of Cisco and got a chance to share our vision of the school of the future. With COVID-19, learning from home, uh, just as we have the working from home, learning from home is getting popular as well, has become synonymous with all the children and is being used every day extensively by our 15,000 students. LFH is used heavily, not just for regular classrooms, but also for enrichment, remedial, and for co-curricular activities and cultural center activities. I must point here that when Japan was the first country to enforce a lockdown, our schools in Japan were able to restart classes just a matter of five days as they were all completely virtual classrooms ready. So what we do in addition to this is we have skill studios that complement our digital classrooms. And the skill studios complement the virtual classrooms, the open classrooms, and the nature-based classrooms as well. So what do we do here? Through these 42 skill studios, we offer skills-based learning or one can say vocational learning to develop multiple dimensions in their talents and which allows our students 
to go beyond the academic and sports excellence. In our smart campuses, we have a choice of skills-based studios like digital design, maker studio, robotic and innovation studios, ceramic studio, radio and television studio, culinary studio, music and dance studio, language studios, and many others where we have successfully implemented various skills-based learning modules. The safety of our students is very important to us, as is to everyone, especially in the post-COVID era. We already had a number of elements in place to ensure that our students are safe in the premises. Besides traditional security, we had installed over 700 CCTV cameras at one of our campuses to provide that extra layer of safety. Then there are the non-touch facial recognition readers outside every classroom, which provide contactless attendance as compared to the biometrics which were used in the past. As this is considered to be more safe. So going forward in the COVID era, we, have, we will have face masks, face shields, desk shields in every classroom to ensure that minimum physical impact is minimum physical contact is uh, initiated. As you know that some of these countries in Asia, like Singapore, Malaysia have already begun to start undoing the lockdowns and in a very restrictive way are beginning to open the schools uh, within these countries. We will also be doing contract tracing for all the schools. So COVID basically has taken us and put us on the back foot. Economies are affected and education sector has been impacted too, as we heard from the various speakers before us. For GSF schools, now that's a system in place and education continues unhindered. It is time to think about what will be the post COVID reality for the, especially for the education industry. Social platforms like FB, Google and others will soon see an opportunity to scale up their video conferencing platforms for allowing teachers to provide education. With 5G, a large part of school education will move to the mobile as we heard earlier but 5G is still way ahead in many countries. Teachers' jobs would expand in breadth and depth to, to be the influencers and guides to direct the students, to stimulate them and encourage them to become global citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Atul Timurnikar. Thank you so much for sharing all the insights and your experience of how you rode over this tide with the help of virtual classrooms. And I'm sure there's a lot to learn from you because uh, these models, not only in the education sector, but at large in the business sector, uh, there's something for us to learn from uh, no matter which sector we belong to. And I see that the chat box is full with a lot of questions and uh, it's time for me to invite back Mr. Srikant Sharda, MD Accenture Technology, because there are a lot of questions I think which are still unanswered. I invite you, sir, once again, to please conduct a Q&A session and have the answers to all those questions. Thank you, Ritika. Uh, and thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Timburkar, um, your thoughts about technology impact on education. I think till a few days back, a few couple of months back, online education was primarily used by the professionals for a higher education, higher uh, professional courses. But this pandemic has kind of fast-tracked everything overnight from a physical class to a virtual class and not only the class but as you mentioned also the entire the extracurricular activities music sports uh, yoga and whatnot right uh, and just to let you know even government of india has announced that till up to class 12 there will be a dedicated satellite cable channel uh, to cover various subjects courses for the uh, uh, students who cannot afford the laptop or the high end mobile but they can do that on the on the, on tv so thank you very much. Uh, I, we will open it for the questions and I'm just going to the chat and we have maybe the one first question is coming is on this. How do you transform from the brick and mortar uh, kind of education system to a virtual online one? You have narrated your journey. Any thoughts to the people who are going to that journey? Uh, any thoughts that you can share uh, from your side? Sure. Um, you know, I think today mobile is the biggest connectivity platform for us, be it uh, any sector. And education per se is 
fully can be delivered on mobile. It's just that mobile has been seen as a communication device and has not been seen as a mission critical device. But today it has become a mission critical device. So we that there's a, going to be a lot of opportunities, particularly products and services, ed tech companies are going to see a, a new niche for offering sort of, you know, the touch component, the virtual touch components for between students and parents and the teachers. And this will basically create new opportunities to create the ecosystems, you know, the, what is available on the social space. And that's why I said, I won't be surprised uh, I was talking to a few people in Facebook uh, a few days back, and they were talking about, you know, how do we really take this uh, social platform and make it more meaningful rather than uh, just use it for the social space. So I think the technology exists on a mobile. Uh, you don't really have to go and make large investments, uh, though, of course, uh, schools who are brick and mortar schools can typically start looking at, you know, some freeware tools for video conferencing and start using it. And I think the other important aspect is that there's going to be a lot of software tools available on freeware basis, which will allow the collaboration and, you know, submission of assignments and conducting of exams. For example, uh, we, we are currently in the process of implementing a fully AI monitored exam tool, which will allow us to conduct exams anywhere in the world uh, with full uh, encryption capabilities and also monitoring the students. In fact, the solutions are available in India. I mean, today banks are using these proctored solutions. Uh, so are some public service commissions. So there is a dearth of solutions already available in the market. The only thing is as a board, we have to be kind of going to a discovery board and see where are the solutions, who can be available to us, what can we use on a more economical basis. And I'm sure there is a solution that fits every budget and every pocket. And which is what we need to probably go and explore. Hey, uh, Ajay, uh, Atul, the next question is very interesting. And I sometimes face myself as well, especially for my uh, kids. How do you uh, kind of manage the young lear learners in the virtual world, especially their attention span? And the related questions uh, on that one is, uh, are you using the virtual re reality for education? Right. So let me answer the second part first, which is very easy. So... Yes, we have a virtual classroom that we have set up based on uh, the technology such as Zoom. And we had actually set it up much earlier, about two years back, and we were using it in a very uh, limited way. But then we kind of expanded given the opportunity that we had for pandemic. So we expanded immediately uh, across the, all the schools. And today I'm proud to say that more than 15,000 students are already using it daily on a live classroom basis. Uh, there are some, some schools where they're unable to do live classrooms, so they switch on to sort of learning or LMS systems, uh, allowing students to kind of you know, take assignments and submit it. So there is a full ecosystem. We have our own software company based out of India. We do all our uh, backend systems and all our legacy systems are done in-house. So we are able to kind of you know, move with a very great speed in order to adapt to the changing atmosphere uh, without waiting for new products to emerge. Uh, coming to the first question, yes, I think there is an interesting uh, uh, aspect that some one of our speakers said earlier about mental health. And mental health is also becoming extremely critical with regards to students. So what we have observed is that uh, typically the activity-based programs for young learners, I would say between three to six years, uh, happens to be a bit more restricted. You know, it doesn't really happen for those three to four hours. It can be limited. Uh, but it's also kind of parent administered. So it's not like child is sitting alone in the house. Uh, but what I'm surprised to see is, you know, recently there was an online play that was done by some students in Singapore. And I was surprised to hear one of the six-year-olds actually, you know, rejecting the parents to help her out, to connect to Zoom and, you know, participate in the play and act her out. Because she said, you know, I'm already using it in my school. So I don't really need to be taught how to use uh, the Zoom buttons, you know, where to switch on and where to switch off. I can do it myself. So kids, as you know, have been a great adapter of technologies. Uh, I'm, I'm sure four or five year olds also have not so much of a problem because you know one of the first things they do is pick up a smartphone or a tablet and start using it. So I think once they see how it is done, uh, it is very easy for them to use. Coming to the aspect of mental health, there is a, a big uh, challenge for us going forward because as it is, some of these digital platforms have made a lot of children kind of inward looking, uh, a bit more challenged because you know they are kind of dis disengaged from the social systems. So we have set up uh, a WhatsApp-based uh, helpline 
for the students to, you know, be, particularly because of COVID, to really reach out to their counselors. And this is worldwide. We picked up a couple of WhatsApp numbers around different countries. And now we have close to 40 counselors actually you know, responding to those uh, WhatsApp messages uh, around the world. So we have to maintain the mental health of every child. We have to look at what are the triggers and what are the, you know, typical patterns that are emerging. And there are children who, like one of the panelists said, it's kind of getting bored sitting in the home all the time. So there are people affected. I think our idea is to make sure that if and when somebody is affected, we should be able to quickly get that alert or the child should be able to happily or freely kind of respond back to us. And we, our counselors will do the needful. So it's an it's a engagement time. We have to really work with every single individual or every single child to make sure that we pass through these times. And who knows, you know, this is a huge speculation from, uh, you know, some of the regional leaders saying from the COVID being a one-year philosophy, a one-year phenomena to a two-year phenomena, or some even saying it could be more than that, and something that it could be, you know, lasting just till it happens. But I think we are fully prepared to look at emotional, mental, psychology of the child to make sure that they go through this period. And they actually make best out of this and become productive in life. Thank you, Atul. And I agree with you about the uh, uh, children being very tech savvy. My own daughter and son, within 15 minutes, they learned Teams, everything, Microsoft Teams. And I was trying to help them. I said, don't worry, we, have, we know everything, maybe more than uh, what I learned uh, by using in the office. We have uh, some more questions coming up. Just let me go through that. Uh, uh, question is, um, there are some news about Zoom not being safe. What are the other platforms that you would kind of, uh, should be preferred? Any thoughts? I know uh, it's not kind of authenticated, but any other, what are the different platforms that you would suggest uh, if someone wants to go on this online virtual learning mode? Yeah, I think the, the solutions which are already available uh, are in public domain. You have Google, uh, we solutions, you have, uh, you know, the WebEx solutions, and we have been users of WebEx for many years. Uh, and then there you have Zoom as well. So I think our experience has been, there's been too much of noise rather than the, the substance of it. Uh, and I think where people actually uh, kind of had a problem with Zoom, including uh, one of the government schools, actually teachers had a problem where you had some strangers kind of, you know, Zoom in. The problem was that uh, the links were kind of forwarded by students uh, to different people, and these were pure links without any passwords. So, you know, I, I come from a technology background. I used to be with IBM Singapore. So I do understand many of these uh, cyber issues and security risks. So when we deployed it, we actually deployed with the uh, uh, passwords. Uh, we had, uh, you know, links sent out. Uh, our passwords and meeting IDs change because they're all integrated. Our Zooms are integrated with the ERP that we have. So it's much easier for us to kind of change the passwords and the meeting IDs uh, over a period of weeks. Uh, having said that, I think all solutions are safe. It's just a matter of being a bit more careful and uh, using all the kind of you know, information that's available into you to make sure that you do the right settings uh, so that you don't really you know, make it easier for a stranger to barge in. I think that's, that's very simple. And uh, if one basic, uh, follows the basic uh, routines, uh, it should be a pretty enjoyable experience. And thankfully, or touch wood, we've had not a single instance over the last uh, 60 to 90 days. Thanks, uh, Atul, and I agree with you. The online requires some specific aspect of security to make sure that it is not, uh, the people who are using online are not exposed to that one. Uh, thank you very much, Atul, for one, first, the good work that you are doing in bringing education to the lot of people thank at you. their home. Thank you very much. I hope that this uh, crisis, that journey accelerate across the, all the regions uh, in the world and in India as well. Ritika, over to you for the next segment of the uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Srikant Sharda, for conducting such interactive Q&A. And thank you, Mr. Ratul. Thank you for all the insights you shared. And I'm sure this uh, webinar today has been very enriching and very enlightening for all of us attending this right now. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you to all of you. Um, I'm sure we all are going to rise from these turbulent times. We at IOD family believe that we all will work together. And uh, when we look at our strategies as board of directors, we will look at more resilience and more preparation for the unexpected. 
um, as a very important part of it from now on. And uh, before I um, invite Mr. Ashok Kapoor for the vote of thanks to be delivered um, this afternoon, I would like to remind all our members about a very interesting uh, um, webinar which is coming up next, uh, which is scheduled for 9th of June, Tuesday. Um, and um, which is about a board's role and strategy overseeing risk and uncertainties in COVID-19 pandemic by Professor Anil Gaba, the ORPAR Chair Professor of Risk Management, Academic Director, Center for Decision Making and Risk Analysis, INSEED, Singapore. So make sure you join in for this one. It's gonna be, again, a very good learning experience. The details of it are already out on our website and we will be very shortly sending you the detailed emailers as well. And ladies and gentlemen, before we let all of you go here, I invite Mr. Ashok Kapoor, who is uh, the retired IES Director General, IOD India, to please join in and propose a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ritika. Uh, first of all, it's my great privilege and a pleasure to welcome today to this very educative webinar uh, enriched by our very distinguished panel of eminent experts and speakers. We are also grateful to more than 600 participants who have uh, participated in this webinar uh, in spite of the fact that we had we could not give a very long notice. Uh, the, the trend for discussions was aptly uh, initiated by General Aluwalia, President IOD, that how do we turn this crisis into an opportunity? And uh, ironically, in the Chinese language, the crisis and opportunity mean the same, two sides of the same word. And some of the very, uh, we are grateful to the uh, distinguished speakers for giving us really such ideas as would make uh, IOD even more future ready to, to acquaint the boards of directors with some of the rapid technology advances that are going on. Before I uh, thank them for their various uh, uh, concepts about as one of the uh, eminent speakers said, contactless technology. So basically, we at IOD are converting this into a virtual uh, contact technology. We may not be physically in contact, but virtually and mentally we are. One of the speakers did say that the, a large number of people get bored over a longish curfew and lockdown. Well, I am glad to tell them that such webinars being organized by IOD has relieved the boredom of a large number of our participants. And we are encouraged by the fact that uh, uh, one of the eminent speakers said that the way forward now for future ready boards would be global uh, supply chain management. But looking to the fact that today we have uh, participants from almost all countries. We have from Asia, we have from US, the UAE, from the Middle East, from Africa, and even Latin America. I think we are uh, going to make it into a global participation chain. Uh, another uh, very eminent speaker said that we have shortage economy, uh, which has been plaguing the uh, country. But I must say that considering the response today, even from eminent experts, we have no shortage of talent in India. And this will supplement our otherwise physical shortage economy. Uh, this brings me to the, uh, the concept as, uh, as explained by one of the speakers about telemedicine in remote areas. And I think this is probably here also. IOD India uh, can make a contribution by quoting from Mahatma Gandhi, uh, who said that, and I quote him, that uh, the uh, 
India of his dreams is a village republics where 70% of the Indian population stays or during Mahatma Gandhi's time stayed. And this technology we are going to uh, propagate will be connecting all those um, uh, remote areas with mainstream uh, functioning of governance, which will be a uh, realization of another dream of Mahatma Gandhi. We have noticed even in IOD that uh, in the last few years, earlier policy used to dictate technology. The time came lately when, when technology was dictating policy. But from the deliberations today, we are now coming to the view that for future ready boards, the, the, the policy will dictate technology. And uh, the points made for uh, the technology fluent as made by uh, some of the eminent speakers about technology fluency and changing the mindset would facilitate this through such uh, uh, webinars. And uh, the uh, another aspect, the another uh, common theme that is running through the the learned de deliberations of all the speakers has been that we can prepare the boards through such webinars and through such learning into what has been known as the appropriate technology for India and also to be shared with the world. That uh, which will be a solution to future uh, uh, problems as one of the, as the last speaker said, now technology for survival. And uh, the appropriate technology could be a, 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 a tool for the, what some of the technology savvy, uh, sorry, educational institutions in Singapore are doing that they are, uh, they are having, uh, they are preparing students for digital classrooms. And I'm sure we can translate this technology to digital boardrooms. And uh, to conclude once again, our grateful thanks to all of you for being with us. And uh, the, the, uh, one of the very important points made is that some of the, uh, one, some of the universities abroad and, and as our distinguished guests from Singapore said that you see they have developed a uh, password for getting into a technology savvy uh, working. So IOD is also a password, but it's an open password. That is an open password to future boards is IOD website for an interactive growth. Once again, I'm so very grateful on behalf of the Institute of Directors for all of you. And I'm sure the technology for young learners will prove to be a good adaptive for technology for fresh learners in the boards, those who may not have a technology back. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ashok Kapoor. Thank you so much um, for proposing the board of thanks. And uh, thank you to all of you, all our members who joined us, uh, more than 600 of you, I'm told, from more than 10 countries right now are with us here. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We hope to see you in our next webinar. I already shared the details with you. It's scheduled for 9th of June. We hope to see you there. Till then, stay safe, stay healthy, keep learning, keep growing. Thank you.